Hello, I'm Lindsay Scholl, and welcome to the Dorothy L. Sayers Podcast, Episode 2. I'm here to talk about Sayers, one of the leading writers of the early 20th century. Now, I could have said Christian writers, but I left it off there just for a second because she actually made her name on the Peter Whimsey Detective series, which sports no particular spiritual affiliation. But right before the beginning of World War II, Sayers stopped writing detective fiction, and she went the route of writing stage dramas, and these were often of a spiritual or ecclesiastical nature. She wrote a play about the architect of Canterbury Cathedral, she wrote a play about the Emperor Constantine, and several others. At one point, the BBC asked her to do some radio dramas about the life of Christ, and that's what we're going to talk about today, specifically how she used or didn't use what she called Bible talk. Also, I want to give a shout out to my mother-in-law, Kay. She's not only a remarkable woman, but she's the one who actually introduced me to Sayers by giving me a volume of Peter Whimsey stories. So I can't go too far into this podcast without giving her a great big thank you. Now on to episode two, Avoiding Bible Talk. Okay, I'm going to throw a bunch of words at you. Are you ready? Resurrection, arise, abide, justification, sanctification, saved by grace, saved by faith, sin, dead in our transgressions, dead in our sin, white as snow, washed in the blood, saved by the blood, the power of the blood. Do you get the idea? There are many more that I could have included. And if you haven't grown up in church, you may not know I'm sure you know vaguely what I'm talking about, but they may, these may not be very, very familiar to you, in which case you may be in kind of a good spot for the meanings of these things because they're going to be kind of fresh. But if you have grown up in church, then you know that these this is familiar language. It kind of rolls over you. You're used to it. The power of the blood. You're saved by the blood. You're not really probably visualizing blood. You're probably not visualizing uh, whatever it is you would visualize with justification. Um, you just kind of, they just kind of roll right over you. And on the one hand, familiar language is is liturgy. It's and a liturgy is an order of worship and that's good. Every church has an order of worship. Uh, one scholar, James K. Smith, argued that basically everything has an order of worship. Even going to the mall has an order of worship. So that's kind of a cool idea to think about. But if you're in a church or religious setting, you know that you kind of follow certain protocols. You say certain phrases, you say uh, certain um, expressions over and over at certain times. And this can be good. This is order. And it also keeps you uh, from saying the wrong things or professing the wrong things. And it kind of keeps it orthodox. Uh, On the other hand, you stop listening to it. Uh, I remember once I was reading the uh, Harry Potter. I was kind of trying to learn some writing tips. and, and, And my husband suggested that I read Harry Potter and kind of see what was going good in Harry Potter. One of the things I noticed was how she used the phrase, he said, often. And I had been trying to like spice it up and say, oh, he said, he he smirked, he groaned, he twittered, whatever. Um, but he said that one of the things that would, Rowling did that was good is the phrase he said, you stop seeing it. It just kind of like it does something and it, it plugs in the next dialogue, but you don't really pay attention to it. Well, that's not what we want to happen usually with stuff we feel strongly about, such as a faith. Why am I going on about this? Well, this does relate back to Sayers. In the early 1940s, the director of religious broadcasting at the BBC was Dr. James Welch. And he had to rescue a project that had actually gone quite awry. A few months before, the BBC had asked Sayers to write a series of 30-minute plays for the Children's Hour. And this is, oh, by the way, they, these were plays on the life of Christ. This is kind of an interesting side note, but, you know, the head of the English church is an English monarch. England is, I think, still a nominally Christian country. And back in the 1940s, it was also a nominally Christian country. But you also get the idea that in the 40s, in the BBC, and especially in certain areas of the BBC, that they were trying to be more than just nominally Christian. They were trying to use, um, not use, They were trying to draw strength from the Christian faith of the nation to get them through this tough time of World War II. And so Welch was very much on board with that as a director of religious broadcasting. So what had happened was the BBC had asked Sayers to write a a series of plays on the life of Christ. Sayers agreed, despite a very, very busy schedule, she agreed to do this. And uh, when she sent in the drafts, the director was actually not not James Welch, some other guy. Um, the director of the project was actually out of town, 
And the assistant director was a lady named Miss Jenkin. And Miss Jenkin read through the drafts and liked them. But she also asked Sayers in a letter back to her if she could be allowed to, if she, Miss Jenkin, could be allowed to discreetly edit the plays and not um, and change some words because she thought she thought it would go over the heads of the children. And also, by the way, she couldn't actually send her the drafts back because that's too much paper and paper was in short supply. So, she, but they would just notify Sayers of the changes that they were making, and then uh, Sayers could approve. Well. If you've if you listen to the last podcast or if you know anything about Sayers, you know that she is a pretty strong personality and that she also feels very strongly about uh, kind of what it is to be an author and a writer and also contractual privileges or contractual obligations. And it this was not this was not a pretty scene. And I don't think Sayers or even even Sayers herself will probably look back on that and say, hmm, I got a little bit fired up there, but but I don't know. But she did get fired up. And there was a, an exchange between Miss Jenkins, between the director of the project and Sayers. Um, there was di- diplomatic manipulation of words on one side, an increasingly fiery commitment to an author's prerogative and to c- the contract on the other. And basically, it stopped the project. Well, Dr. Welch was resolved for this project to continue. Sayers had actually already done a nativity play for the BBC that was pretty successful. And he wanted it to go forward. He wanted another radio drama drama from her. And uh, so he he removed the project from the Children's Hour and thus from Miss Jenkins. Jenkins, sorry. And the plays resumed and were called, as a group, The Man Born to be King. So let's back up and talk about Sayers' ideas on what it is to write religious drama or what it is to write about religious material. And I'm going to read to you from... Now these are these are quotes from her letters, but they're also these are excerpts from um, that are also included in the biography by Barbara Reynolds, 1993, by St. Martin's Press. Press, sorry, she wrote uh, Dorothy L. Sayers, Her Life and Soul, and uh, she does a pretty good narrative of this season in Sayers' life. So uh, Dorothy Sayers re- resumed work. We'll just call her Sayers. Because we all know who we're talking about. She resumed work on the second of oh gosh, well in the middle of May she resumed the work. And this is what she wrote to Dr. Welch. Nobody, not even Jesus, must be allowed to, quote, talk Bible. The thing must be made to appear as real as possible. And above all, Jesus should be presented as a human being. We must avoid, I think, a docetous Christ, whatever happens, even at the risk of a little loss of formal dignity. Now, you're thinking, what the heck is a docetous Christ? Glad you asked. Docetism was an ancient heresy that was um, denied by the church. And the, what the church believes about the person of Christ, is just for the record, that the Orthodox Church, Catholic, Protestant, Greek Orthodox, um, is that Christ is fully God and fully human. He's not part human and mostly God or mostly human and part God. He's fully of each. It's, yes, it's a mystery, but yes, is what the church believes. Docetism believed back in the day that um, Christ only seemed to be fully human. He looked human. He sounded human. He touched, you know, he probably felt human, but he was not actually fully human. And the Greek word for that was uh, was related to docetism. I mean, it means seeming. So when she's saying that we don't want a docetist Christ, what she's really saying is we want a Christ who is human. And for the purposes of the radio drama, we want a Christ who sounds human, who talks human, who doesn't just have a script that he goes through and um, we all know what he's going to say because we've all read it a gazillion times in the Bible. Um, she's going to be faithful to the Bible, but she's going to give Christ a voice, just like we have a voice. And that's what she wants Dr. Welch to approve, and he does. So they go forward in the productions of these plays. And again, this is a BBC. This is a national broadcast. This is a kind of a big thing. So I want to read to you a section from the fourth play called The Heirs to the Kingdom. And this, Christ is not in this, this is about the disciples, but uh, it involves Matthew. And this is kind of funny because Matthew, in Dorothy Sayers' mind, Matthew was uh, going to be speaking with a Cockney accent. And I don't know if the, it was produced that, w- that way. When I read this to you, I don't have a Cockney accent. I'm not going to try one. But that kind of shows what she wanted was she wanted some approachable disciples. Okay. In the scene, Andrew just got taken in a business deal and he's getting reprimanded for it. So... 
No, I'm not. Sorry, not Andrew not, didn't get taken. Philip got taken. Andrew. Six drachmas. Well, really, Philip. Philip. I'm very sorry, everybody. Simon. I dare say you are, but here's me and Andrew and the Zebedees working all night with the nets to get a living for the lot of us, and then you go and let yourself be swindled by the first cheating salesman you meet in the bazaar. Philip. I told you I'm sorry. Master, I, I am very sorry, but it sounded all right when he worked it out. Matthew. Fact is, Philip, my boy, you've been had for a sucker. Let him bring changes on you proper. You ought to keep your eyes skinned. You did, really. If I was to tell you the dodges these fellows have up, the, have up their sleeves, you'd be surprised. Okay, there's just a tiny little excerpt there. Um, the response to these plays was astounding. Petitions were sent to the Prime Minister, Prime Minister of England and the Archbishop of Canterbury, urging them to use their influence to get the plays banned. It went all the way up to Parliament. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Information was asked in the House of Commons, and I'm reading here, by the way, from Reynolds' biography, uh, page 322, if you have to have it, 322 if you happen to have a copy. Uh, the Parliamentary Secretary was asked in the House of Commons if he was, quote, taking steps to revise the script of a series of plays in the life of Jesus so as to avoid offense to Christian feeling. Um, now, the Parliament didn't actually take any action on this, and the public, some members of the public, became just hysterical. Pamphlets were distributed. you got to watch out when pamphlets are being distributed. Uh, one such document read, At a church in Bedford, the whole congregation stood without one dissentient in solemn protest on a recent Lord's Day morning at the request of their minister. And a letter was written, signed by the pastor and the deacons, and sent to the Lord's Day Observance Society. We must go on protesting. Readers were being urged to write their MPs to protest this irreverent use of uh, biblical language. Apparently, according, again, I'm getting this from the biography here. When Singapore fell to the Japanese, so there were some people who in, attempted to interpret that as a sign of anger from God because God had allowed this blasphemy to go on. And so they were mad at the BBC. They were mad at Sayers. Um, apparently, most of the protests were made being made before it was even on the air, so they got word of it or something like that. And Sayers is getting just a, a deluge of of hate mail, I guess, or urgently disagreeing mail um, in response to this, in response to her play. Well, Dr. Welch continues to support, support her. He still thinks it's a good project. He's not asking her to change what she's doing. Uh, so they go on. And uh, what happens is, as the plays go on, the protest does die, die down, I think. But what happens is that people really start to love them. They love hearing Christ talk to them in a way that they haven't heard before. They love getting to know the disciples in a way that you would get to know the characters of a story. It was interesting. It wasn't just good. It was a decent story. And I'm going to read this quote. I promise I'm not going to read for the biography the entire time. But I think Sayers, or Reynolds, I'm sorry, does a good job describing this situation. The nationwide response to the man born to be king was overwhelming. Appreciative, even rapturous letters poured in from listeners of all ages, of a wide range of professions and callings, from laity and from clergy of all denominations. Thousands are still alive. Now, keep in mind, this biography was written in 1993, so this is whoa, 40 years, 50 years later. Thousands are still alive who heard the broadcast when they were young and whose lives were lastingly affected by them. When the series was concluded, the controller of programs wrote to thank her, quote, for providing one of the greatest landmarks of broadcasting. And I want to, this is, I want to go on to talk about some of her articles, but there's this great passage where she's writing a letter to Dr. Welch, and she's saying, stressing the importance of using language that's fresh and accurate, yes, but just not using, relying on the same old terms. And what had happened was the Bishop of Winchester had protested the use of just kind of common dialogue from the soldiers in the fourth play. And uh, he said that um, he was troubled by it. And this is how she responds to Dr. Welch, not to the bishop. I cannot deal with the bishop as I should deal with Miss Jenkin. But I am frankly appalled at the idea of getting through the trial and crucifixion scenes with all the bad people having to be bottled down to expressions which could not possibly offend anybody. I will not allow 
the Roman soldiers to use bare groom oaths. But they must behave like common soldiers hanging a common criminal, or else where is the point of the story? Nobody cares nowadays that Christ was scourged, railed upon, buffeted, mocked, and crucified, because all those words have grown hypnotic with ecclesiastical use. But it does give people a slight shock to be shown that God was flogged, spat upon, called dirty names, slugged on the jaw, insulted with vulgar jokes, and spiked up on the gallows like an owl on a barn door. That's the thing the priests and the people did. Has a bishop forgotten it? Uh, amen. I just, I love that phrase, hypnotic with ecclesiastical use. Now this, guys, this you all have stuff in your background that you, phrases that you've heard over and over again. Um, for me, it, and my very precious and treasured background that I love uh, growing up in the church, um, there are phrases that have grown hypnotic with ecclesiastical use, and I have lost the power of them. And I don't know that I'll ever get it back. Maybe that's okay. But Jesus Christ crucified, um, that was a horrendous death. We all know it. But I don't picture what's going on. If I picture uh, Jesus Christ strangled, well, yeah, I've, I've seen some movies where strangling, uh, fortunately, I've never seen a real one, um, where strangling happens and it's humiliating and it's helpless and it's, and it's prolonged. And it's you feel you feel uh, no matter who's receiving it, you feel sorry for the victim. Um, it is it is nasty and horrible. Strangulation is you can quote me on that. Um, but I don't have that image with crucifixion and crucifixion, I think, was, you know, well, I don't think I know it, it was it was horrible. OK, let's move on. But I well, no, we're not going to move on. I, I want to say one more thing here um, in our world today. In 2020. We have inherited C.S. Lewis. We have inherited people like Sayers. We've inherited the message. We've inherited Veggie Tales. Let me explain some of those things. C.S. Lewis wrote about the character of Aslan as Christ, and he wrote Aslan as his own character, but who's also a different reflection of Christ. He's consistent with Christ, but he doesn't say the same things that Christ does. He doesn't use the exact same words. He doesn't use these and thous. Um, he's in a different context. Uh, he's, uh, he's, so we all kind of love Aslan. If you read the Chronicles of Narnia, it's hard not to love Aslan because he's powerful, but he's different than us. We trust him, but we, we know he's not safe. Um, if you've read the message, that is a version of the Bible specifically translated to catch the power of the English language. We have Veggie Tales. If you're familiar with Veggie Tales, which I'm sure you are, it's, um, it's Bible stories put to, uh, produce. And so you have, uh, Joshua is a, um, uh, gourd, I think, of some sort. Uh, you have uh, peas in there. You have uh, asparagus. You have biblical characters who are vegetables, literally. So we have inherited a whole lineup of writers and producers who are trying to convey deep, profound truths in creative ways to get you to see it from a different angle. They're not trying to change the truths, but they're trying to um, not use the same script over and over and over again. This wasn't going on as much in Sayers' day. If you were to read the man, if you were to go back and read The Man Born to Be King, you would probably not be you, you certainly wouldn't be shocked by it. You would think, oh well, this is not this is a nice way of portraying the Bible. All good here. In fact, uh, you could have it if you're a church, you could probably portray do this, and you probably already have the costumes ready to go. And it's not that radical to us, but in the time, and you can judge by the protests that it definitely was very radical. But we've been acclimatized to different interpretations of gospel like that, and um, and, and they had not. So I want to go back a little bit to um, Sayer's philosophy on all of these things. And to do that, I want to talk about a couple of her articles. I've been using a lot of her letters because her letters are fabulous, but she did write other things. That was part of the point. And there were a couple articles written in 1938. And remember I said in the introduction that Sayers left off detective fiction and started writing uh, dramas and stage dramas in, try, around the beginning of World War II, right before the beginning of World War II. And along these lines, she wrote she wrote a, a play called The Zeal of Thy House, and that's that play about the architect of Canterbury Cathedral. And uh, it received popular acclaim, and so she, in response, she wrote a couple articles. One of them is called The Greatest Drama Ever Staged is the Official Creed of Christendom. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's good works. And the second article is The Dogma is the Drama. 
And I want to talk to you about that second article a little bit because, well, I do. Think about the titles. The greatest drama ever staged is the official creed of Christendom, and the dogma is a drama. She's thinking about drama here. She's thinking about interest. She's thinking about plot lines and characters and witty dialogue and all of that. And what she's saying is that Christianity, as it's expressed in the creeds, as, and by creeds I mean the official pronouncements of the church up to a certain point in history that is based on biblical revelation, because of the, the creeds are interesting enough that they can support great drama and you don't have to add anything. So in the article, the dogma is the drama. She had, she was talking, she talks about how she had somebody after she did zeal of thy house, she had some people come up and say that they simply cannot believe this is, I'm quoting her. They simply cannot believe that anything so interesting, so exciting and so dramatic can be the Orthodox creed of the church. And how she responds, she says, I insisted that if my play were dramatic, it was not, it was so, not in spite of the dogma, but because of it, that in short, the dogma was the drama. And she goes on to say that the reason that we don't get the excitement of the Christian faith is maybe we don't really understand it. Maybe we haven't really thought about it. And she's got this great little excerpt where she is writing a fake dialogue. It's not an excerpt, she's writing it. It's a fake dialogue. It's a fake question and answer. She did not believe the answer she's about to believe about to give, but she writes this up saying, like, if you were to interview the man on the street, this is what he would say about what Christians believe. And I'm going to read just a couple of little things to you from it. I think it's hilarious. Um, I've read it aloud in public uh, to a couple of my students and so on, and they're they're not laughing, but maybe you will. Anyway. This is what the man on the street may believe about Christianity in Britain in the 1940s. What does the church think of God the Father? Answer. He is omnipotent and holy. He created the world and imposed on man conditions impossible of fulfillment. He is very angry if these are not carried out. He sometimes interferes by means of arbitrary judgments and miracles distributed with a good deal of favoritism. He likes to be truckled to and is always ready to pounce on anybody who trips up over a difficulty in the law or is having a bit of fun. He is rather like a dictator, only larger and more arbitrary. What does the church think of the, God the Holy Ghost? I don't know exactly. There is a sin against him that damns you forever, but nobody knows what it is. The Father, what is the doctrine of the Trinity? The Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, and the whole thing incomprehensible. Something put in thought by theologians to make it more difficult. Nothing to do with daily life or ethics. What was Jesus Christ like in real life? He was a good man, so good as to be called the Son of God. He is to be identified in some way with God the Son. He was meek and mild and preached a simple religion of love and pacifism. He had no sense of humor. Anything in the Bible that suggests another side to his character must be an interpolation or a paradox invented by G.K. Chesterton. If we try to live like him, God the Father will let us off being damned hereafter and only have us tortured in this life instead. Um, I'm not going to read it. There's more there. I encourage you to read The Dogma is a Drama. Uh, but... It's a caution, I think, to us as people who try to talk about Christianity to make sure we are absolutely clear, but also um, to approach it in a way that gets people interested in the story of the Christ and have some courage to change it up a little bit. Not the truths, not the character of Christ, but to be faithful to the fact that he was fully God and was fully human. And how do you write about those things? That's one of the things I love about C.S. Lewis and Dante and many other writers is they had the courage to write about certain things. Lewis had the courage to write about what heaven might be like. Dante did too. Dante had the courage to write about, you know, inferno, purgatory, and heaven. Um, it does take courage because you're going to get criticism from other Christians about that. And also as readers, as listeners, to try to listen clearly um, to what's being purveyed and not to just kind of put our own, you know, kind of regular thought upon it, the things that the patterns that we're accustomed to what we might be receiving is something that's outside of our pattern and we need to pay attention to it. Okay. I'm going to stop there and uh, I hope you enjoyed this kind of segment of how to avoid Bible talk from Dorothy Sayers. I hope you enjoyed avoiding Bible talk episode two of the Dorothy L Sayers podcast. I'm Lindsay Scholl and I'm feeling a little bit bad because 
part of that talk that I just gave was about stories, and I didn't actually include that many stories. I just talked about stories, and that's kind of a pet peeve when you're sharing about stories but not giving any of them. So I feel bad. I'm sorry. Next time, I promise I'll give you more stories, and I'll talk to you next time on episode three of the Dorothy L. Sayers podcast. Thanks and God bless. Thank you.